Hello and good evening friends. Today is the third talk in the resident series of ACNS webinars and today we are here to learn about chordomas. As you all know these tumors are very malignant and locally aggressive and they constitute around 0.2% of the skull based tumors and 17% of the bony tumors in which the most common location is in the C1 C2 region. And you are aware that this the total removal of these tumors is a very formidable task and is also a very important factor for survival. to teach us more on this very aggressive malignant tumor we are blessed with the presence of two most celebrated skull base surgeons in the world the speaker for today is the chairman of the skull base surgery committee of the wfns professor sebastian freelich professor freelich is the chairman and head of the department of neurosurgery larry boyser hospital france he is considered to be an authority in the skull base and cv junction chordomas he has published several manuscripts in various international journals in this regard We are so grateful to him to have accepted our invitation and speak to us in our webinars. To chair this session of Professor Felix, we are honored to have with us another stalwart of skull base surgery from Japan, Professor Taki Goto. Professor Goto is the head and chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, Osaka City Graduate School of Medicine, Osaka, Japan. Professor Goto is an important member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and is also the author of several manuscripts in various acclaimed journals. We are so grateful to. him to have accepted our invitation to chair this session on behalf of the education committee of the acns and professor yokukato i hereby welcome today's speaker professor sebastian freelich and the chair professor takio goto to this online platform of acns webinars dr lubun seng from malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction may i please hand over this online platform to professor takio goto uh today uh, i feel very honored to join the this meeting and the chair this session because the uh, professor sebastian as already we know the one of the uh, very famous uh, skull base surgeon in the world and uh, uh, he uh, uh, surgical technique is always fantastic in microscopic and uh, endoscopic and nasal uh, endoscopic surgery so today i am very uh, excited to listen the the his lecture so uh, please uh, give us a good lecture professor sebastian please thank you thank you very much takeo it's it's also for me a, a, a real pleasure to be there for the acns thank you very much for inviting me being with takeo who is a very humble man but an outstanding uh, surgeon skull base surgeon in endoscopy and open so it's uh, it's really a privilege to to share this session with Takeo. Hmm. So I will uh, I will uh, start with my lecture. So as it was said uh, before Cordoma is a, is a very challenging tumor to treat. It's a very rare tumor also. In France we have 60 around 60 new cases every year. So it's definitely challenging to treat because it takes time to understand this tumor, this his behavior, and uh, it requires also uh, significant expertise in uh, skull base techniques to be able to treat it because it's a very centrally located tumor into the skull base. So why? Uh, taking out and resecting cordoma is is difficult it's difficult because cordoma is an uh, invasive infiltrative tumor it's uh, infiltrating the bone and uh, the limits that you can see on the mri are not always the limit of the tumor sometimes you as on uh, in fact quite often you have quite invisible uh, extension of the tumor into the bone that makes a complete resection difficult drilling the bone removing more bone outside of the limits that you feel as the limit is important if you want to achieve a good resection it's also infiltrative between the layers of the dura mater uh, the dura is a multi layer of connective tissue and the cordoma have a tendency to go in between those layers above and below on laterally um to the tumor itself it's infiltrating also the epidural space between the dura and bone along the venous plexuses of uh, along the basilar plexus along the batson plexuses 
of the spinal canal, for example. Uh, and when it infiltrates the soft tissue, uh, it can infiltrate in between layers of the soft tissue, of the connective tissue, between muscles, between aponevrosis and muscles. So you have really to fight against the tumor, to track the tumor if you want to achieve a complete resection uh, most of the time. Here is an example of a skull-based cardoma. You see some tumor into the petrous apex. If we go down, you see some tumor uh, along the jugular foramen with some extension intradurally. If we go lower, same patient, we have some tumor behind lateral mass of C1 along the endotoid process on the right side, but also in the prevertebral space just in front of the anterior arch of C1. Let's go a little bit lower. We have some tumor behind the lateral mass of C2. Uh, between dura and bone in the epidural space. And it's going down to the level of the foramen of C2, C3, as you can see here. So this tumor is not a skull-based tumor. It's a skull-based and cervical tumor, including craniocervical junction. And there is not a single approach that can expose petrous apex from the foramen to C3. And this is an example showing you that resecting those tumors completely is really a challenge. So our experience is based on a significant number of cordoma over the years. All this was started with my mentor, uh, Professor Bernard George. I had the privilege to work with him uh, for several years. And he teach me uh, most of the techniques that are needed to treat skull-based cordoma, especially craniocervical junction and cervical cordoma with the anterior lateral approach. Two examples of completely different cases of cordoma to show you the heterogeneity of this tumor. It's not the same behavior in each patient. This was a patient that came to me with this uh, tumor into the sphenoid sinus, mostly, with some extension into the clivus. Three years before, MRI was normal. She had an MRI for another reason. I did surgery on, he, on this patient. It was a terribly bloody tumor. And uh, it scared me, in fact, because at some point, uh, the blood loss was significant. It was not a young patient. And uh, I, I was a little bit afraid. I could not completely resect the part of the tumor into the cavernous sinus because there was feeders coming from the ICA. It's extremely rare. I had only one case like this. Uh, Post-op was still quite okay. There was some remnant, but most of the tumor was taken out. 2.5 months after, you can see on the control MRI that the tumor is back. So an extremely aggressive tumor. In fact, proton beam therapy was much more efficient than my treatment because she survived between two to three years. And uh, what uh, she benefited most of was proton beam therapy in this specific case. This is another patient with 69 years old. I have seen him, uh, Bernard George saw this patient in office 30 years ago. At that time, he was just complaining of uh, diplopia and he had some tumor into the petrous apex. He was lost on follow-up because uh, diplopia recovered by itself. He was not operated. He had no biopsy. Around 20, 30 years after, he came to me because he started to be symptomatic. And this is a tumor that was uh, found on the MRI. Huge tumor with sign of brainstem uh, compression. Uh, I did surgery on this patient and I achieved a near total resection. My goal in this patient, because I knew that this tumor grow in 30 years, my goal was to keep the dura intact to avoid a CSF leak. I used the endoscopic endonasal approach. And I did not do uh, proton beam therapy postoperatively in this patient. And I am following this patient since uh, then. This is a post-op MRI. So completely different behavior between those two patients. This shows you for a specific tumor, how it is important to understand the tumor you are treating before jumping on the tumor uh, to bring the patient to the OR. In the vast majority of the cordoma I am treating, I am waiting a little bit to have at least two MRI 
uh, with a minimum of time of two to three months in order to calculate the tumor volume and to compare it between both MRIs. This gives me an indication of the growth rate, how fast the tumor is growing. And I think it's a very under underestimated uh, prognosis factor for chordoma. It is used for low-grade glioma, for example, but for chordoma, I think we are underestimating this uh, factor. And I have to say that in our experience, there is a correlation between the growth rate and the prognosis of those patients. We need more patients. Now we could do a study on around 35 patients. We need more, but it seems that it's an interesting factor. It's very rare that you have to treat a patient for a chordoma in emergency, extremely rare. Usually the patient is coming to see you in the office with an MRI. This MRI was done usually between one and two months and you schedule, schedule the surgery one month after. You have three months to give you this important information. Uh, let's uh, uh, look first at the endoscopic endonasal approach at, uh, at some of our results uh, with uh, uh, some of patients, uh, patient of our series, sorry. Uh, so this was uh, our result uh, since uh, 2018, uh, 167 patients. One characteristic of our patient is that most of them had a surgery before coming to see us. And it's a very important factor because as you will see later, the prognosis of those patients with an incomplete surgery before being referred to a scan the page center is a negative prognosis factor. 20% had radiation therapy before coming to us. Tumor characteristic in 50% uh, percent of cases, there was some intradural extension. Cordoma encased vessel, they are not necessarily infiltrating vessel, but quite often they encase carotid artery in the cavernous sinus, uh, vertebral artery at the craniocervical junction, and sometimes basilar artery intradurally and other vessels. The vast majority of our patients had radiation therapy post-op. We have proton beam in Paris. And the patient who had not radiation therapy before, they have uh, proton beam therapy post-op. We published our result with proton beam therapy. You can see here that our results are similar to others. In fact, the survival for Cordova is between six to seven years and uh, our results are similar to other publication. So it's definitely a deadly tumor, but with an extremely uh, extreme heterogeneity between patients. Here you can see uh, in, this, uh, in this table that uh, the, gross, uh, the rate of gross total resection uh, is important. Uh, extent of resection, sorry, is extremely important. In fact, it's a, it's a main prognosis factor in Cordoma. The goal is really to try to achieve a complete resection and to follow this with proton beam therapy. I think everybody agree now that this gives a better chance for uh, the patient. There is also a factor uh, influencing prognosis and influencing extent of resection. Obviously, when the tumor is extending intradurally, it's more difficult to achieve a, a, a complete resection. When vessels are encased, it's the same, more difficult to achieve a complete resection. And the risk also increase. And as you know, in skull-based surgery, more than in other, any other field of neurosurgery, you always have to balance uh, the risk with uh, the benefit. Influence of treatment is extremely important. And it is, this is what I was saying before. If the patient is coming with previous treatment, previous partial surgery or radiation therapy that was not properly done, uh, not considering the aggressiveness on cordoma and the fact that they require a very high dose, then when the patient come to you, uh, it's more difficult uh, to treat those patients. And the prognosis is not the same. The conclusion is that cordoma is extremely rare. And I strongly believe that it should be referred to centers where people know what is a cordoma, understand the behavior of the cordoma, 
and have managed the technique to be able to treat uh, adequately a cordoma. Uh, Craniocervical junction are doing cordoma are doing worse than skull based cordoma. Why? Because probably it's more infiltrative into the soft tissue. Uh, the complete resection of a, of a big craniocervical junction cordoma is more difficult uh, to achieve. So we have different techniques to treat those patients in the skull base or craniocervical junction. An extended endonasal approach have been. Uh, really a revolution for the treatment of uh, skull-based cardoma. Why? Because it's a central skull-based tumor. Uh, it's really located uh, center most often on the clivus or the, the center of the craniocervical junction. And it makes a lot of sense to come from the natural cavities of uh, the nose or the mouth. It's much easier to access this region this way than doing very complex transpetrosal lateral approach. Anatomy is extremely important, as you know, working in the lab, understanding the anatomy, understanding the right variation of the anatomy, like you can see here, is extremely important if you want to manage those techniques. If you just look at anatomical textbook, for example, you will not be aware of the variations of the anatomy. If you dissect again and again, you will understand that the ICA in the cavernous sinus coming from an endoscopic perspective is completely different from one patient to another. This is uh, our endoscopic series uh, finishing in 2016. We have much more patient now. But this uh, series is to show you the complexity and also the risk of the endoscopic endonasal technique. This was the beginning of our experience. We started in 2005. Uh, so we were not completely uh, ready uh, to, to, to proceed with this complex uh, surgery. And we made progress, for example, with, with closure, but still, as you can see, as you will see, it's not an easy surgery and there is complication. So it's 85 endoscopic endonasal surgery. In 11 cases, we did two stage uh, for craniocervical junction. Patient had a, a previous surgery in a significant number of cases and they had radiation therapy also in 20% uh, of cases before we did uh, uh, the surgery. For example, if a patient has been operated before, uh, going back endoscopically, you may not have uh, the nasoceptal flap anymore to close. So the risk of CSF leak increased significantly. And for our series of patients, it was the case in a significant number because 68 patients had a surgery before. So you can see here that achieving a complete resection is much easier if the patient it's if it is the first surgery for the patient compared to the situation where the patient have been operated before. In our series, you can see that the rate of CSF leak was quite significant, 18%. It's not so different than the results reported by uh, the Pittsburgh group. It's around uh, 18, 19%. Obviously, we are doing better now, and in the last five years, our rate of CSF leak is, is definitely better. But you have to consider that in this series of patients, again, uh, a lot of patients had a surgery before, and the technique we used to close uh, could not include the nasoceptal flap because it was used before. But still, the rate of CSF leak is significant, and uh, this complication is not completely solved. For craniocervical junction cordoma like this one, for example, it's a big tumor going in both condyle, infiltrating the jugular foramen. There is a little bit of intradural extension here uh, next to the vertebral artery. We decided for this patient to do an endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult approach. It's a challenging approach. You need a lot of space to work. We did uh, resection of uh, part of the inferior turbinate, resection of the eustachian tube to have access to the condyle. We drill the condyle to expose 12, but also to get to this piece of tumor that was quite far back lateral against the vertebral artery. At the end, we could 
uh, we could uh, uh, identify the vertebral artery behind uh, the, the condyle. So very extensive surgery. We did a nice resection, but the outcome for the patient was not so easy. He had, this patient had to be fixed the next day because of the instability. And uh, the post-operative course was not a few days because we did an endoscopic approach and after a few days, everything is fine and the patient can go back home. No, it was not like this. This patient stayed for several weeks uh, because of the mobility of this extensive approach. Velopharyngeal insufficiency was significant with some swallowing issue at the beginning, nasal regurgitation, nasal speech. This tumor was uh, creating an obstacle in the airway, but once you're resected, there is a kind of empty space. And, and, and this was the cause of nasal regurgitation and nasal speech. There was mastication difficulties uh, in this patient because we went in the pterygoid area. And uh, because of the resection of the uh, Eustachian tube, this patient complained of otitis media and uh, she needed to have some, uh, you know, this device uh, to, to put through the tympanic membrane to treat uh, otitis media. So a long recovery. And on the top of this, you need to understand that we need proton beam therapy after two or three months. This is a delay between surgery and proton beam in our institution. And proton beam therapy make all those symptoms, all this nasal mobility worse. So <clears throat> uh, definitely, oh, I'm, I'm, um, I am uh, going through those four slides. It's, it's in the wrong position. So definitely endoscopic endonasal approach is great, but the more you go laterally, uh, the more it's risky for the patient, the more the mobility increase because you have to resect more normal soft tissue. When you resect a turbinate, it's not like uh, doing a pterionine approach. When you do a pterionine approach, you don't resect the skin. You don't resect the muscle. You transpose all of this. When you do an endoscopic endonasal approach, when you resect the septum, you don't put it back. When you resect the, uh, the middle turbinate, you don't put it back. If it's one turbinate, it's fine. But if it's both turbinate, septum, inferior turbinate, posterior pharyngeal mucosa, this has a cost for the patient. The risk of ICA injury also increase. The risk of cranial nerve injury, 6, 12 increase. And if you open widely the dura, the risk of CSF leak increase. We get better, but still, it's a challenge to close. So I think we need to think of how to reduce the mobility of the endoscopic endonasal approach. Endoscope is made to work in a deep space to take advantage of the natural cavity, uh, not necessarily to create a big space to work. And I think we have to think of how we could go back to the true meaning of endoscopy. We need to improve dural closure. We need to be less aggressive to resect less normal tissue. We may need to select better the approach. It's not because we are having endoscopic technique now is that we have to forgot previous technique that were very efficient. If you look at Almefti results for Cordoma, uh, I think it's one of the most, the, the best results uh, in terms of outcome for those patients. And he was not using endoscopic and as an approach. So we should not throw into the garbage uh, the other approach. We just have to select a good one for the good patient. And it's not uh, on one side, uh, surgeons that use the microscope on the other side, surgeon using the endoscope. No, all these must be mixed. Those are just tools, microscope and endoscope, and we need to select the best tool for uh, a specific uh, lesion. So for the last 10 years, I am using this technique, what I call the CHOP6 technique. We published it. Uh, it's an uh, it's, uh, appealing name, but, uh, but uh, more than this, it's, it's, I believe, an efficient technique to, to be minimally invasive with, uh, with endoscopic endonasal techniques. The principle is that I uh, work in one nostril in the vast majority of cases. I uh, hold uh, the endoscope with my left hand, and with those fingers that are not used to do anything, I am holding uh, the section, and it's a rotative and malleable section. So 
I have a, the right hand to hold my working instruments, which can be a dissector, which can be scissors, whatever. So I'm not using a holder. And I think the holder is an issue because having a holder is like having a pillar in the middle of your surgical field. And you have a lot of sword conflict. And if you don't want to have sword conflict, you need to uh, uh, go back with the endoscope to, to create some space in front of it to avoid sword conflict. Me, I am holding everything in one hand. So I don't have sword conflict. I don't put any power holding the endoscope because the endoscope is holded, is supported by the endonasal anatomy. It's uh, the turbinate, the inferior turbinate. It's a soft butt rest, in fact, for the endoscope. The only thing I need to be careful of is the endoscope not to fall down into the nasal cavity. But I don't need strength to control the endoscope, to control the instrument. And I think that strength uh, is a counterproductive uh, to avoid sword conflict. This is a section I use, my label, rotative section, and this is how I manipulate this section. Outside the nose, it's very difficult. Inside the nose, it's very easy because my endoscope, my section can only go in the same direction because I didn't create a cavity into the nose. It's very narrow. So at the end, the tip of my endoscope, tip of my uh, uh, section are next to each other. I just need to do a little bit of rotation with my section and I can really move the tip and browse a wide surgical field. This is an example of, uh, of Cordoma treated with this technique. You see that I am, the, the endoscope, is, the section is not moving much, but it's sucking the blood and endoscopic surgery, you have a lot of blood to suck if you want to see something. And, uh, and I am using other instruments with the other hand. This was not done with the chopsticks, I have to say, for this suture, I ask someone to hold the scope for me because you cannot stitch with uh, holding the endoscope. But it shows you that you still have some very precise movements because everything is kept into a very narrow space. One extremely important thing with this technique is that because the corridor is narrow, if you want to see in the corner, once you are into the tumor cavity, you need angle instruments, you need angle scope, you need my label, uh, section. This was a view of the back wall of the carotid artery, Petrus ICA, with a 75 degree scope, 70 degree scope, and with a bended mylabel section, and the bend was more than 90 degrees. So it was like a hook. This is the type of instruments you need if you want to use those kind of trajectory. This is a case of Cordoma uh, that we treat with this technique, craniocervical junction. It's a big tumor. And here we used another principle. We consider that the mucosa of the rostrum, in fact, is like the skin. You get in front of the rostrum, you incise the skin, you get into the tumor, you remove the tumor, you remove the mucosa of the sphenoid sinus, you file the, this space left by the tumor left by the, uh, the volume of the sphenoid sinus, you put fat into it, and at the end, you suture the skin, you suture the rostral mucosa. We have applied this technique in, uh, in uh, I would say, five, six uh, cordoma. We, we are in the process of, uh, of submitting an article on this. And I think it's a very nice technique because it's really the true meaning of the endoscope. Small incision deep into the nasal cavity, and then you put the endoscope inside and with angle instruments, you take advantage of the endoscope looking on the side. So here was a resection of the mucosa into the sphenoid sinus. You progressively drill the rostrum of the sphenoid to go down, you drill the clivus. It takes a little bit more time. You need angle drill. But again, with the chopsticks technique, you don't need a lot of space. The more space you have with the chopsticks, the worse it is. This is again back wall of the, of the carotid artery. I have a completely bended uh, section to, to, to track this tumor. <coughs> it's easy with cordoma because cordoma is soft. And uh, most of the cordoma, you can suck it with a strong suction. At the end, we put fat into the cavity. Uh, and at the end, we close the, the, the rostral mucosa like stitching, it's a little bit challenging, but with, with uh, training, uh, you get better and you do it faster. 
watertight uh, closure of the rostral mucosa. And, uh, and I think it's the best barrier to fight against uh, CSF leak. Putting a nasoceptal flap uh, on the fat is not watertight. It's just something that brings epithelialization, but it's not made to stop a leakage. Here, it's a, it's a stitching of the nasal skin, I would say, that I think is the best barrier to fight against uh, CSF leak. <clears throat> So this is a post-operative MRI, and this is the fat that is uh, filing uh, the cavity. Improved dura closure. How could we improve dura closure? This was the type of approach we were doing before, using this gasket seal. You have a huge cavity made into the nose. Someone is holding the scope. I have used this technique, but at the end, I was not very satisfied with this technique, and this is why we are trying to move to more uh, minimally invasive, and uh, technique uh, to really go back to the, to the true meaning of the endoscope. I have used all type of closure, multi-layer, gasket seal, suture. I have put everything into the nose and I was disappointed with everything. I had, I had leakage with all of these techniques. Uh, what I am using now is in addition to what I just showed you, trying to stitch the mucosa when it's possible, it's not possible for all the cases, I am using this technique based on, uh, on, on controlling the uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, great idea, great concept uh, coming from Napoli, uh, Luigi Cavallo, Paolo Capabianca. Great concept coming from Nasa Hirochin in, uh, in Tokyo. They are focusing on intracranial pressure. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's, uh, it's what we were trying to do with, uh, with uh, lumbar drain. If the, you don't control the intracranial pressure and the intracranial pressure is high, you can put whatever you want to stop the leakage. The, the pressure will be stronger than you. So we have to find natural way to reduce the intracranial pressure. Keeping the patient in 45 degrees sitting position after the surgery, immediately after the surgery, you bring the patient from the table to his bed, you keep the patient 45 degrees. Without uh, supine position for two weeks, always day and night 45 degrees. I think this is the best technique. Obviously you need to close with something, but what I do now is just a big piece of fat and a flap or a stitching of the mucosa like I showed you. And I keep the patient in 45 degree minimum for uh, around two weeks. And with that, I have to say that I have the feeling that I have much less uh, CSF leakage. Masaori Chin is using the same concept, except that instead of pushing, putting the patient 45 degrees, he's using a lumbar drain with a pressure control uh, system on it. But at the end, it's uh, the same uh, concept. Closing is not only a question of closing the dura, it's also a question of covering uh, the critical structures that you have exposed, even if you don't have a CSF leak. This is an example of huge cordoma, but it's not crossing the dura. <coughs> so the issue is not CSF leak here because the dura was kept intact. But with this patient, we have exposed carotid artery on both sides. We have exposed cranial nerve on both sides. And those structures cannot be left like this without coverage deep into the nose, because if there is infection, it may be very bad. You may have carotid rupture. You may have arteritis. And we had one case like this in the past. This is another example, big tumors. Dura is intact, but at the end, you need to cover the surgical field. And the nasoceptal flap is not always enough, especially in this case. It's a huge surface to cover. So this is why we designed this flap, which is a combination of uh, nasoceptal, uh, floor on lateral wall of the of the cavity of the nasal cavity pediculated with both uh, uh, septal artery and inferior uh, turbinate artery. So we need to find new techniques, new way to improve our result, our closure, and this is this is uh, what is nice with with our job is is to constantly try to, to, to get better. Approach selection is definitely extremely important. And I will show you now 
uh, multiple cases. With these three slides, you see that our indication with endoscopic technique on the nasal have raised significantly, and it is still the vast majority of, uh, of our patients uh, that we treat with endoscopic on the nasal. This is a very simple cordoma, <coughs> the classic one, center on the clivus. Uh, you see here the tumor is very soft. It's, it's, a, it's not very difficult, in fact, it's even easier than a complex pituitary. With a Vasalva maneuver, look, the, pay, the part of the tumor that was intradural completely came uh, back uh, extradurally like toothpaste. At the end, coverage with, uh, with a nasoceptal flap. This is a more complex case, very challenging. This tumor was, uh, was very firm, uh, important contrast enhancement, which is, I believe, uh, uh, some kind of a prognosis factor. It's not proven, but the more there is contrast enhancement, I think uh, the, 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 the more difficult it is to treat. This tumor was extremely challenging. And at the end, you see that behind the, the, the PIA, there was some little spot of infiltration behind the PIA matter. So this patient impossible to cure. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this patient died uh, maybe four or five years after uh, the surgery. Uh, this was a case that I was thinking would be more easier. Uh, it looks uh, away from the brainstem, maybe a little bit infiltrative. I mean, pushing the brainstem, not very infiltrative. I thought it would be easy. And in fact, uh, this is, it was very difficult. Here also, we used the CHOP6 technique, the same uh, than before. We did a nasoceptal flap in this case. Uh, here is uh, exposing the paraclival ICA, drilling down uh, the floor of the sphenoid sinus. This is a resection. And once we, we get to the basilar, we understand that the basilar is completely encased. It's even more than encased. It's infiltrated by the tumor. And the branches coming out also, as well as some perforators. It took us a very long time to dissect all those vessels uh, from the tumor. At the end, we made it. At the end, we had no, no complication with this patient, but it looks sometimes nice on the MRI, and it can be extremely challenging when you get to the tumor itself. And we close with the 3F technique with a big piece of fat keeping the patient seated for two weeks. I will skip this case. It was a, this is a very interesting case. This patient had a clival cordoma that was mostly, mostly uh, into uh, intradurally. There was almost no tumors extradural. At least we could not see it on the MRI and on the CT scan. Would you use an endoscopic approach? I will be interested to, to know what Takeo would have done in this case. What my fear was CSF leak. Uh, because you need to open widely the dura to have a good control of this tumor. If you make a small hole, you will just uh, be able to suck some, a little bit of the tumor inside the tumor, but not to completely resect it. So you need a wide opening and she's obese. She has a very high BMI. We know that high BMI, you have a, 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 a strong increase in the rate of CSF leak. Why? Because intracranial pressure is raised. So in this patient, we decided to do a, a transpetrosal approach. And we did the classic combined petrosal approach, giving you multiple line of sight, principle of, uh, of, uh, of Osama Al-Mefti, Taka Fukushima, it's, uh, on Professor Hoata and Takeo Goto. It's very well described now. The only thing you need to do to be able to do that is to train, to spend time in the lab, to train again and again. But it's definitely a neurosurgery approach that uh, everyone who spends the time, dedicates the energy to do it, can do. So this is transpetrosal, uh, uh, shaving the labyrinth, opening the dura, it's much easier to do a combine in a patient who have not a, a petroclival meningioma because the bone is normal, the dura is normal. So it's, it, it's not a very difficult approach. It's like an FTOZ, but it's, it's behind. So now I am on the cordoma. The cordoma is uh, sucked progressively and freed from the cranial nerve. There was some brainstem infiltration at some point, not very much, but I was happy to be uh, with my microscope, because with my microscope, I had a very nice control of the structure. And the closure is like usual, you just need to make sure 
that the mastoid on the middle ear is, is closed uh, completely and, and sealed watertight. Postoperative course in this patient was, was fine, and I was able to achieve a complete resection. This was another case, small cordoma, CP angle, but quite lateral, almost purely intradural. Should I go endoscopic? Again, significant risk of CSF leak, and laterally, that's where you don't have much control. The sixth nerve is the issue. You resect the tumor, but you know that on the other side, you will have six. If you suck the tumor on six and into your suction, by mistake, because you didn't uh, reduce the power of the suction uh, early enough, you have a post-op six, complete six. So here, my goal was to keep six intact. So we did an anterior petrosal approach. I thought coming from lateral, controlling six, and then resecting the tumor uh, would give more chance to keep six in this patient. So uh, anterior petrosal approach, uh, I took everything I could with the microscope, and then I put the endoscope in the slide to, uh, to finish the resection of the lower aspect of the tumor that you cannot really see with, uh, with the microscope. And this is the video, putting the endoscope inside. I use the same chopsticks technique, uh, putting sponges to create like a nostril. Uh, I, can, I can really use uh, the, the sponges as a support for my endoscope. into the clivus, but from intradurally to achieve a complete resection. Uh, this was a case also of a recurrent cordoma treated with, uh, uh, with three surgery before, 2011, 2013, 2014, and he had radiation therapy. You could tell me, why are you operating this patient? I mean, it's, uh, it's over for him. He had already three surgery, radiation, yes. I agree, but still, this tumor is very slow growing. And the behavior of the tumor did not change after the surgery and even after radiation therapy. So it's a slow growing tumor, and it makes sense, in my opinion, to try to resect, to put the clock again to zero. And this is what I did. I did uh, uh, what I did. I did a surgery on this patient, not to cure, but to, to, gain, uh, to gain several years. I did uh, uh, not an endoscopic endonasal approach because it's going too far laterally. And this piece here is inside the brainstem. And if you come from the front, it's going to be tough to control this part here. So here again, I decided to do transcranial approach. I did a combination of uh, transpetrosal, anterior petrosectomy, and transylvian approach. Why? Because using the anterior petrosectomy, once I had resected the tumor, uh, it was very difficult to go up, to go up, and I had the third nerve in front of me, and some tumor was below the third and on the other side, and I was afraid of, uh, of uh, injury to the third nerve, and you know that you, if you injure the third, you have uh, lost uh, the eye because uh, you have to close the eye for the patient. So I did also a transylvian approach to have a better control of third coming out from the brainstem. This is putting the endoscope through Transylvian and controlling it with the endoscope uh, through anterior petrosal to really locate this piece of tumor that was really uh, next to the origin of third into the brainstem. And with the combination of both using the endoscope, I was able to resect this piece of the tumor which was an important piece to resect because if these piece were growing, it would have uh, uh, given uh, probably rapidly hemiparesis uh, to the patient. <clears throat> I will talk a little bit. I have still have time or? Yeah, sure you can, please. Okay, you, you will have to stop me huh, because I can stop for, I can talk for hours. <laughs> so, so I will talk a little bit about craniocervical junction cordoma. Craniocervical junction cordoma is, is a little bit of a different challenge because of the location of the tumor. And we have also multiple options to, to reach the craniocervical junction. On the nasal, posterior approach, posterolateral with transcondylar or anterolateral approach, anterolateral elite from Fukushima, uh, which I learned from uh, Professor Bernard George. As I said before, craniocervical junction cordoma, I think are going worse than clival cordoma. 
endoscopically, it's more difficult because it's much deeper. Again, as you, you have seen it with the case I showed you at the beginning, you have to resect sometimes a lot of normal tissue to expose the tumor laterally. On the control of the neurovascular structure is not always easy. You have the parapharyngeal ICA, you have the 12th nerve. And when you have opened the dura, the control of CSF, of CSF leak is, is sometimes very challenging. And finally, uh, you should not forget that most of the patients after the surgery will be unstable. So they need an additional surgery to stabilize. Resecting a craniocervical junction medially is perfect for endoscopic if it's uh, on the midline, but if the cordoma is more lateral, again, you need to resect much more uh, tissue. Uh, it's a more extensive approach. And as I said before, uh, uh, the morbidity for those big tumors is, uh, is, is much, uh, much worse uh, than for midline tumor. This is a midline tumor, perfect, perfect tumor for endoscopic endonasal. And this is what we did. Simple approach, you don't have to resect anything into the nose. You push inferior turbinate on the side. You do it one nostril, two nostril. The opening is already made. <laughs> you flap, you push everything down, you peel this U flap from the anterior aspect of the tumor, you drill the lower clivus, you drill the anterior arch of C1, and with fungal instruments, you can take all the tumor out quite easily. Be careful with those pieces of tumor along the endontoid process here. This has to be tracked um, if you want to achieve a complete resection. We used angle endoscope, angle instruments, because we wanted to avoid to unstabilize this patient, and we wanted to avoid uh, to drill the, um, the anterior arch of uh, C1. This is another case, a complex case, uh, craniocervical junction with intradural extension, as you can see here, uh, significant one. We are very deep here. I thought, should I use the endoscopic approach? What, are, what is against the endoscopic endonasal? First, it's quite extensive. You see that it's going down uh, in front on the anterior arch of C1. It's going along odontoid process. If you want to take this out, you have to drill anterior arch, so you will destabilize for sure. It's going into the condyle. It's going quite laterally, uh, not very far from the carotid artery here in the parapharyngeal space. It's going into the jugular foramen, and it has a big extension intradurally with some relationship with the brainstem here that is not very nice. Relationship with the cerebellum also. If you look at T1 with Gado, look at this contrast enhancement here. Why is it uh, enhancing here and not here? Probably because there is some PL feeders coming from the posterior circulation. And this is exactly what I was afraid of. So this is why I decided not to go endoscopic, but to go posterior lateral, far lateral, transcondylar, putting the endoscope inside to reach the different compartment of the tumor. Uh, so this is far lateral, posterior lateral, uh, transcondylar. You see that there is a pathological fracture of the condyle. I did a mastoidectomy, open a little bit the jugular foramen to have a better control of the jugular foramen prior tumor resection. Then I go into the tumor, easy part. I take uh, everything I can with the microscope, drill the lower clivus, control the prevertebral space, go down with my, my endoscope. Uh, to, to reach the, the tumor along the odontoid process. You can even drill a little bit the tip of the odontoid process. My issue is, is the upper part, the upper part that is into the petrous apex. Put the endoscope inside, <coughs> 45 degrees, 70 degrees, and uh, control the paraclival and petrous ICA from below and reach the sphenoid sinus. Here, the only thing I didn't want to do is to open the mucosa of the sphenoid sinus because then I have also a risk of CSF leak through the nose. So we were able to achieve a complete resection in this patient. And at the end, at the end, what is nice is that you can open the dura and you can work on the intradural part with microscope, with micro instruments like we are used to do it. And you can completely resect the dura that you feel is infiltrated. If you do an endoscopic endonasal, the smaller is your endoscopic uh, or dural opening, the lower will be the risk of CSF leak. 
So you, you may limit the resection of the dura because you're afraid of a leakage. Here, I'm not afraid. I can resect everything I feel is pathological. The only thing you need to do is to close properly the mastoid process. <clears throat> so this patient was completely resect. And finally, and this is the top of it, I could fix this patient during the same stage. So he had a complete resection plus fixation in only one surgery. Uh, what is this? Hold on a second. Uh, I forgot the images. I want to, I will finish with, uh, with this case and, and then I will go to, to conclusion. This was another tumor of the craniocervical junction. I hope we have the images with the video. This was a huge uh, craniocervical junction cordoma. Uh, I, we don't have the pictures, but huge one. Uh, here, I decided not to go antero, uh, I also decided to go posterolateral for the same reason to try to fix at the same time. So it's the same type of, uh, of videos, except that the tumor was lower. It was not going into, into the clivus uh, up like before. We needed in this case to do a transposition of the vertebral artery because we needed to use a corridor of condyle, but also lateral mass of C1. So this is transposition of the vertebral artery, uh, drilling then of, uh, of the condyle, uh, using the corridor of the condyle uh, to get uh, to the tumor. This is drilling of the condyle, identification of the hypoglossal nerve. I have switched the position of my microscope to now look in front of the craniocervical junction. So here, drilling the condyle, and I reach uh, the tumor. Same principles than before. You resect everything you can with uh, the microscope. And then at some point, uh, you get limited because the tumor is going on the opposite side also. And uh, so here is a place for the endoscope. I put the endoscope same way I would put it into the nose. Movement and, uh, is, are the same. Uh, same way to use the endoscope, same chopsticks technique. And I am looking on the opposite side with a 70 degree scope at some point. Start with 30 degrees, then 45, and then uh, 70 degrees. There was a little bit of dural infiltration. I resected uh, also. And on the opposite side, you can see that we get to the opposite condyle with uh, opposite 11th nerve, and uh, we get to the opposite vertebral artery. You will tell me this is, this is quite a complex anatomy to look at the opposite side from the front of the dural sac. Yes, but we were prepared for this surgery because we had a research fellow, uh, Ariana Fava, who did some work in the lab on the subject. The project was to look at the vertebral artery from the opposite side from a posterolateral transcondylar uh, corridor to see what we would face during surgery like this one. And this is what you have to do when you uh, uh, think of a new technique. You have to prepare this new technique with the most, uh, the, the, the best understanding of the anatomy possible. At the end of the surgery, we put some cement between what was remaining of lateral mass of C1 and the drilling of the mastoid. And we fixed, bended the roads to, uh, to prepare the patient for proton B. And this is the work that uh, our research fellow at that time did, uh, looking at the anatomy of the contralateral vertebral artery uh, from, uh, from the opposite side. Because here the challenge is to reach the, the, uh, the safest way possible, the contralateral vertebral artery, and to get control of it. And the safest way is to use the uh, transverse process of C1, transverse process of C2, to reach first the segment of the vertebral artery that is into the vertebral foramen. Uh, I finish with this one because it's an example of anterolateral approach. This was a case of craniocervical junction cordoma with also intradural extension with maybe a little bit of encasement of the vertebral artery. For the same reason once than before, I was not feeling comfortable with endonasal approach. So here we used anterolateral approach. It's a beautiful approach for cordoma of the craniocervical junction and cervical cordoma. 
uh, incision here in front of the sternocleidomastoidian muscle, uh, incision over the mastoid to do sometimes mastoidectomy. If it's in the cervical spines, you don't need, but if it's in the craniocervical junction of, or jugular foramen, you need mastoidectomy. Exposure here of transverse process of C1 to get control of the vertebral artery, resection of the tip of the transverse process of C1, exposing here the vertebral artery. We need to transpose because the transposition will give us a huge road, a big road to lateral mass of C1, uh, odontoid process, anterior arch of C1, control lateral lateral mass of C1, control lateral condyle. The same at the level of C2 if you transpose the vertebral artery from the transverse foramen of C2. This is the beauty of the approach. You go from one side to the other. The only difficulty is the control lateral vertebral artery you have to be careful of. Uh, we did also a retrocic craniotomy here after uh, infralap approach to control the jugular foramen. And, uh, and we did the uh, intradural uh, approach to the intradural part of the tumor. Uh, we dissected under the microscope those tumor, this tumor with multiple balls away from the cranial nerve. In this case, there was not in fact infiltration, but multiple balls uh, in between the cranial nerve. At the end, we put the endoscope. We look at the cervical spinal cord from above and we look at the opposite side. And you see this little ball here, just medial to the opposite jugular foramen. I think if I would have gone endoscopically, I could have uh, me, uh, forgot this piece because coming from anterior, you really need to look on the side to see it. But here I am coming from the side. So this was, I believe, an advantage, a better chance to achieve a complete uh, resection. The same, we put a piece of cement here to stabilize the patient. Uh, and uh, for some of them, we can avoid fixation up front. We do proton beam therapy before with a collar and we do fixation at the end. In this case, it was a combination of endoscopic, endonasal and posterolateral far lateral. I am going fast because I'm, we are running late. And this was also a case of anterolateral approach perfect case for anterolateral because there is two sites for this tumor, craniocervical junction, but also C4, C5. So anterolateral approach was perfect to first expose the part of the tumor down and then to go uh, to the craniocervical junction. Here we did a transposition from transverse foramen of C1, but also C2 because it was completely infiltrating C2. So it's a little bit lower than before, but still it's going also into the clivus. So we did the resection. And at the end, what's difficult with anterolateral is to go up into the clivus. And here is the room for the endoscope. You see the transpose vertebral artery here. And then we work between both hypoglossal nerve. Here you have the, the, the right hypoglossal uh, to really go into the clivus up and to, to completely drill the clivus. Uh, at the end, we put a piece of C1, of cement, uh, sorry, uh, as you can see here on the post-operative CT scan. Here also, lab work before. I did this because I had a research fellow, Davide Di Carlo, who studies this in the labs, studying how high you can go into the clivus with an anterolateral approach. And he showed me, if you want to go high, you need to use this triangle below hypoglossal and the triangle above hypoglossal between jugular foramen and hypoglossal to put your endoscope. And then you can go to the upper clivus. So I think I am, uh, I am done. Uh, Post-operative instability, we talked about it. If you can avoid to, do, to fix before a proton beam, it's better because it's easier for the physician to plan proton beam. If you cannot, you do it. But most likely, they will not be able to use pure proton. Surgery of chordoma, you need to be aware of the risk of seeding. I consider chordoma like infection. If you take a piece of chordoma, you give the ranger to the nurse. The nurse is not cleaning the instrument. He's giving you back the instruments, but there is still chordoma on the tip. And when you go again in the surgical field, you put some chordoma along the surgical approach. 
you will have a tumor growing a uh, few years after inside the skin, inside the muscle. So be careful because the cordoma cell can grow everywhere. So there is seeding in the subarachnoid space. You need to be careful for the cordoma not to seed in the subarachnoid space. This is one of the issues of endoscopic endonasal approach is that you can have seeding going down, like in these patients. These cells were going down in the dural sac, and at the end, few cells became this piece of tumor. This is seeding into the nasal cavity. This is seeding into the frontal lobe. And this is surgical seeding. This is not metastatic. The surgeon is responsible for that. So cordoma, extremely rare, challenging tumor to treat. We need referral center for cordoma. Uh, we need center that can manage all the technique. It's not impossible. It's something you need to be dedicated uh, of. And we need to understand that we, we, not, we are not the solution for cordoma patients. The solution for cordoma patients is to find alternative treatment. So this is also the advantage of reference center. Whenever we treat a cordoma, we put the tissue into biobank. And the researcher are working on those samples of tumor to find the treatment of cordoma. There is not so much therapy for cordoma there is a tazemetosta that is nice for any loss uh, for dedifferentiated cordoma. We had some fantastic response, but it's only a very few number of patients that can benefit of that. But targeted therapy is definitely the future and the hope for those patients. Thank you very much. This is our hospital. Uh, and uh, thank you again. It's a teamwork. I have the privilege to have a very nice team of, uh, of people working with me. Uh, thank you for the nice lecture. I purely impressed uh, your uh, lecture. Uh, when we uh, try to treat the uh, large cordoma, we have to run the both techniques, endoscopic and microscopic, all scar-based techniques. So the uh, recently the young neurosurgeon just want to run the less invasive treatment, just keyhole uh, endoscopic surgery or just endonasal endoscopic surgery. But actually, uh, if we try to uh, radically remove the cordoma, we have to master the both technique, crash car, scar based approach, and also endoscopic uh, technique. So uh, I think today your lecture was very impressive to me. Uh, uh, could you uh, give the, some comment to the young neurosurgeon or young scar wave surgeon? Uh, I, I think uh, you and me, we share exactly the same uh, idea on skull based surgery. It's, it's exactly what, what, what you said. And I have to say that I am always very impressed also with your presentation techniques because you are one of the few that manage uh, extremely well endoscopic, endonasal, transpetrosal, I mean uh, everything I have uh, showed. Your, your, your school is, uh, your, your department is really an inspiring school for, for skull-based surgeon around the world. And it's, yes, skull-based surgery is not only endoscopic on one side and uh, open on the other side. Complex skull-based surgery. You need to 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 master to understand all those approach, and even more important, you need to think of how to do better than we are doing now. Mm. Because uh, I hope that the resident working with me uh, will not uh, spend uh, 15 years to reach the level I reach. I hope they will reach this level in five years, in 10 years. They will be faster than me and able to do uh, approach less aggressive than the one I am doing. And what I don't like sometimes is to see that we consider uh, improvement uh, with more aggressive approach. Improvement with endoscopic technique, it should be to work in a narrow, narrow, more narrow space and to do the same through uh, a, a more uh, minimally invasive technique. 
we are limited with our equipment. We have only four millimeter endoscope. If we had two millimeter endoscope with a very thin and tiny uh, camera, it would be a dream for us. If we had angle mm. uh, instruments, we, yes, we are limited with instrumentation. But this is the beauty of skull-based surgery is that we can always do better and this should be our goal to be better, less aggressive and leaving uh, less impact on our patient uh, after surgery. I think we share the same, uh, the same uh, idea, the same spirit. That's very okay. nice of you complimenting each other. I was just reading uh, yesterday about your latest article that I was talking about, but fibrobacillar artery encasement in codomas. And you have presented very good series about uh, 34 patients, uh, well, from nearly 176 codomas that you have operated from 1996 to 2018. As this is a paper from Pierre Olivier Champagne, he was a, a fellow with me uh, uh, two years ago from Canada. Yes, absolutely. Right. So in that entire series, there was only one case of stroke. So that was an excellent uh, series of uh, codomas with vertebrobacillar and case. Mm -hmm. Really uh, congratulate you for such uh, outstanding surgeries that you do and the training that you give to your residents. Uh, in that article, you have mentioned that you never, you sell, very seldom do DSA for uh, for making out uh, encasement. You only use T2 weighted thin slice MRI. Uh, yes, uh, uh, angio is 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 rarely done. I, I have to say for for skull base uh, cordoma and even craniocervical junction cordoma. I do angio for cervical cordoma when uh, when I, I have a duct on uh, on the vertebral arteries when it's very blunt on one side or when there is a direct PICOM uh, pica given by the vertebral artery. In those cases, yes, I do angio. Or sometimes to look at the, the radiculomedullary artery uh, below the level of C4, for example. Uh, but for, for craniocervical junction or uh, skull base, not so often. And also you have mentioned that the recurrence was more when you left behind tumor of uh, more than one centimeter cube. So yeah. how do you measure that? Is it post-operative MRI? Yes, post-operative MRI. We do an MRI in the first 48 hours post-op. It's very important to do the MRI as early as possible. If you really want to, to be able to appreciate the remnant of tumors, the more you wait, the more you will have contrast enhancement because of scarring process, and it will be more difficult. So we do a thin cut MRI, thin T, T1 with GADO, but also thin T2, 3D uh, MRI to, to really appreciate the volume of what we leave behind. Yeah. Would you consider stenting in cases where uh, tumors are encasing and narrowing the vertebral basilar arteries? No, I've never done it. I have to say I've never done it. What I have done uh, in, in some cases is uh, at the craniocervical junction is sometimes bypass uh, when, when there is only one vertebral artery and, uh, or, or one very dominant vertebral artery with the occipital artery. I am now in the big cordoma of the craniocervical junction, always keeping the occipital artery intact until the end of the case to make sure I transpose it, to make sure I have something uh, in case of uh, injury with uh, the vertebral artery and if it's an important one. May I please open this topic for discussion again? Yes, my co-host Liu. Hello, Prof. Thank you very, very uh, nice uh, lecture. I love uh, nice uh, uh, surgery. Uh, I wish to ask Prof uh, for in case of uh, CSF leak, uh, how early do you intervene? Do you wait for certain days of lumbar drain to work? Uh, and uh, what are the manual been applied, including the use of antibiotic and any medication? So it's a very, very, very good question. Um, so first about uh, the leakage. If you have a leakage post-op, and uh, what should you do? Uh, go back early or wait and see, put a lumbar drain. It depends when the, 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 the leak occurs. If it's a very early leak, if it's not a big leak, but few drops, I put a lumbar drain and I, I try to, 
to stop the leakage and uh, with the scouring process, I hope that it will, uh, it will be done. If it's a leakage that come after five, six, seven days, uh, it's gonna be tough to close it with a lumbar drain because the scouring process, in my opinion, is already behind most of it. So I think you can still try. You may stop the leakage, but when you remove the lumbar drain, it may come back. So the timing according to the surgery, I think is an important factor. If it's a huge leak, it's really leaking, leaking, leaking a lot, then I think you need to go back. If it's a few drops, yes, you can have it with a lumbar drain. Uh, I have tried in few cases of uh, a few drops to go back with an endoscope and to inject uh, glue. Uh, I learned this from Luigi Cavallo from Naples and uh, it worked in, uh, in, in one or two cases. Uh, but it depends on the, the flow of the leakage. If it's a high flow, uh, difficult. If you open the third ventricle, for example, it will be difficult, I think. You will need most likely to go back. But uh, as, as you probably uh, uh, understand it the same way I do, it's, uh, it's a case by case uh, decision. About antibiotics, uh, when I started with endoscopic endonasal uh, approach, our uh, ICU doctors, they didn't want us to keep the patient under antibiotics passed up because they were saying, you will select uh, bad germs uh, if you keep uh, strong antibiotics for two or three days. But I figure out that all my American colleagues, I don't know if Takeo is using the same, were putting those patients when they had a leak during the surgery, big opening of the dura for uh, under strong antibiotics, wide spectrum for two or three days. Uh, and I have to say that now I have a tendency to do that, to keep antibiotics for two or three days uh, when I have a big opening of the dura. Do I have less infection with this? I don't have the data to, to tell you if there is a difference or not. But what I was not doing before, I, have, I am doing it now. Because in the past, we had uh, two cases of bad meningitis. Well, I, yeah. But I think most important for, to avoid CSF leak again, and this is something I completely changed, is to work against intracranial pressure. Keeping mm -hmm. the patient 45 degrees uh, at least, fighting against uh, constipation, uh, avoiding uh, coughing, everything that can raise uh, intracranial pressure yeah. is Regard important. Regarding the 45 degree prof uh, after surgery, do you experience problem like uh, pneumocranium, transient pneumocranium uh, no. post-operative leaving? No. For that position? no, no, not yet. Yeah. May come, but not yet. Yeah. Yeah, my, my last question, Professor, uh, if uh, your, your, your view on using mucosal-like uh, skin in the nasal cavity and the, the, the classical teaching is to make a flap with a pedicle, vascular pedicle. So with your concept, do you actually minimal opening of the uh, mucosa just enough for you to put your instrument? So is that Absolutely. what you're trying to tell us? Yes. Absolutely. The goal is to avoid the nasal septal flap. Because mm -hmm. the nasal septal flap is a pain for the patient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whatever you say, I see a lot of people say, why well, it's nothing, you just wash your nose. But when mm -hmm. you do a perianal craniotomy, do you need mm -hmm. to wash your air six times a day? No. Yeah, no. Yes. So when you do an endoscopic approach with a nasal septal flap, you need to wash your nose for three months, four mm -hmm. months, five yeah. months. If you are living in a big city with a lot of pollution, it's mm -hmm. for six months, one year. You yeah. need to wash your nose and still, Sometimes patients complain one year, two years after. Mm -hmm. We cannot say it's nothing. If you ask a good question, the patient will give you the good answer also. Yeah. So the goal is to avoid, in my opinion, uh, nasoseptal flap. I, I think it's very useful. You need to know how to do it. And in mm -hmm. some cases, I am using it. But mm -hmm. with this concept, I am trying to avoid it as much as possible, only when it's absolutely necessary. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Hidehito Kimura. Hi. Hi. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Professor Sebastian. A very, very excellent presentation. I learned a lot so much. So uh, also, I am so impressed. Of, of course, 
of your surgical techniques sound also your enthusiasm to remove the so big chordoma, including a so big chordoma. Nice techniques. So we have to know about the scalpel techniques also uh, anatomy also. Uh, you have we have to know go to the uh, cadaver lab also. We need to go to the surgical uh, suite, operative suite before going to the yeah surgical suite. We have to go to the uh, lab. Yeah. So I have one question for you. So you mentioned in your presentation you have proton beam therapy. So after the partial removal of the sub subtotal removal of the chordoma. So what is the optimal timing for the uh, additional tra treatment for the chordoma? If you uh, have some remnant of the chordoma, one of only once uh, at once, and next surgery is uh, what is the optimal timing for the next surgery? Um, so your question is, uh, what is, should, should you do proton beam therapy for yeah. all patients? Yeah. On when, sh Sorry. when should you do it early or wait and see before something yeah. is growing? Yeah. Um, I, we do proton beam therapy for all cordoma patients. And every time I didn't do it, I regretted it. All time, every time. Yes, I have to say every yeah. time. But I have to say that the vast majority of patients, big, big majority of patients I had, um, uh, we did proton beam therapy upfront and we do it between two to three months. The patient I showed you at the beginning of my presentation, I didn't told you everything, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I hide something from you. Mm. So this patient was seen 30 years ago in office. He had this tumor and I saw him, I did a resection, he was 69 and I did a subtotal resection that was quite nice. They compressed completely the brainstem and I said, he's 69, tumor is very slow growing, let's wait and see. Because proton beam therapy is not nothing. Patients get very tired of it. It's a very high dose. There is side effects. There is sometimes temporal lobe, radionecrosis. This happens. So I wanted to avoid this for this patient, considering that it was a very slow growing tumor. Mm. In fact, I did surgery on him last week, four years after, because he had a recurrence with some compression of the optic chiasma. When I had this recurrence, I say to the proton beam therapist, can you do proton beam therapy now? And he told me no, because there is optic nerve and chiasma yeah. compression. So I had to go back with a transcranial approach. This was my mistake. Yeah. My mistake was not to, not to follow carefully enough this patient because uh, he had an MRI in the COVID period at the early this year and we missed it. I didn't yeah. saw that it was getting uh, close to the chiasma and uh, he did not came to, to office. I mean, you all know the situation. But the last MRI, yes, we, we had to decompress before. So this, this indicates that uh, wait and see in order to avoid eventually proton beam, why not? But you need to know that it's a very slow growing tumor from follow up before surgery and you need to have a very close follow-up after surgery. I because see. if you miss the time where the tumor is getting close to the optic pathway, then you need to go back and then you missed uh, something. So chondrosarcoma is a different story. Chondrosarcoma, I almost never do upfront proton beam. I am not fighting to get the last piece of chondrosarcoma. It's, it's much better to have a chondrosarcoma grade one or two, especially if it's close to midline uh, than, uh, than a cordoma. I think it's time. We have learned a lot today. We'll wind up today's session. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of the Yukogato, I would like to sincerely thank today's speaker, Professor Sebastian Felich, and the Chair, Professor Takyo Goto, to have come here spend that time and gave us a very good information about uh, cordomas, the surgical techniques and uh, the complications. Uh, we are really grateful to you for uh, giving such a beautiful lecture to us. So until next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us.